Joel Kaplan founded Oregon Law Group January 1, 2011, after having practiced with several large and medium-sized law firms. His firm provides the same kind of real estate and corporate transactional services as the big guys do. His practice emphasizes the financing side of real estate, everything from joint ventures, syndication, mezzanine financing, TICs, real estate equity funds, from the complex to the not complex real estate transactions. He has extensive experience in acquisitions, financing, sale, and management of multifamily communities. He tells me the only time he's been in a courtroom is for a wedding and jury duty, and he wants to keep it that way. Please welcome me in joining Joel Kaplan. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping in my talk I can drum up some business for our good friends at uh, HFO. I'm privileged to count among my clients some people who are very forward thinking, uh, willing to take chances, they're well capitalized, and in the past six months they have gotten very active in buying apartments, in uh, developing Apartments. Uh, I literally have lost track of how many closings we've had in the past six months, and uh, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars of transaction volume, and they've got more in the pipeline. Before I talk about how to structure transactions, I want to spend a little time sharing with you some of the things I hear from them, some of the things I see. Um, I'll let the HFO guys talk about cap rates and Patty can talk about interest rates. I want to spend a few minutes focusing on some of the big picture demographics that are leading my clients to make some very, very big bets in the uh, multifamily market. You know, big picture, if we look at the economic collapse uh, that occurred in the last few years, you know, what caused it? We had a collapse of capital markets that were built on a house of cards. They were built on people buying houses they couldn't afford, lenders making loans to people who couldn't afford based on appraisals that weren't real. Uh, we had fear you couldn't get anything done. We had deals that were stabilized, that could pay the debt service. You just couldn't find any lenders willing to take chances. It was just you know, pervasive fear in the economy. Um, I th an interesting anecdote I found, one of my clients had been predicting the collapse of the single family market for years. And when it happened, you know, I said, well, aren't you overjoyed? Now everybody is gonna move out of those houses. They're gonna get foreclosed. They're gonna move into apartments. Now, back in at least 08, 09, there was a temporary period where all of a sudden rents got soft, vacancies went up. It's like, what happened? Well, everybody was doubling up, tripling up. They were moving back home with their parents. Now, we're getting out of that. We're now, hopefully, into a recovery. A lot of good things happening. One of the things you'll see in a couple of my slides is demographics related to Generation Y. Um, kind of 18 to 34 year olds, my kids, perfect example. They're in grad school. Sooner or later, they're gonna get out of grad school and they're gonna want apartments. Uh, that generation you're gonna see is very specific on where they wanna live. They probably, far more than my generation, want to rent. I mean, they've seen, you know, I, I grew up being told you gotta buy a house, you gotta buy the most expensive house you can afford. They've seen the result of that, and they're not interested in it. You're gonna see more mobility, more renters. Uh, Patty mentioned construction costs. I've got clients who are trying, everybody saw a couple days ago, I think, the Oregonian, um, or Business Journal, I don't remember, report about four apartments under construction in the Portland area. I've got clients trying to lock in construction everywhere they can, because we're at the bottom of the market on construction costs, You'll see demographically, this might be a bet to have apartments that are open over the next few years. Uh, this Generation Y, uh, you know, this is more, you know, the numbers aren't all that meaningful except they're getting bigger. Uh, you know, when we get to these blue bars, that's how many people are entering this 18 to 34 year gap. 
um, minus how many people are leaving it because they turned 35. Every year through 2015, because of the echo boom, that number is getting bigger. Here's another graphical representation of the same thing. The, uh, the green are ages 20 to 24. The, uh, I guess, gray is 25 to 29, and the rust color is 30 to 34. You can see going out through March, uh, excuse me, out, out through 2013, in all three categories, those numbers are getting bigger. And if you can't see the scale on the left, the uh, 20, 24 year olds, there's gonna, in 2013, there's gonna be about 22 and a half million of those. Um, in about 21, 22 in the other age categories. <coughs> this is a representation of how many 18 to 34 year olds are living at home. And I think we had a big bump in that. This, this is a little dated. You can see the chart ends around 2007, 2008. But everybody either experienced or has friends who experienced that. The, Kids get out of college, they can't get jobs. What do they do? They move in with mom and dad. They don't want to do that forever. I guarantee you mom and dad don't want that to happen forever. Uh, eventually those people are gonna be converted into apartment dwellers. This I think is a real key if you look at the demographics. This is a representation by percentage, uh, how many households own a home and historically it was below 64 percent and then in uh, 2003 and 4 before things crashed it got up to 69 percent. There were a lot of people buying houses who had no business buying houses. Now will Wall Street have short memories and let them buy houses again? I don't know. But at the end I pose the question, you know, is that number going to rise are more people going to buy houses? Are fewer people going to buy houses? Um, I've read somewhere recently there's something like $2 trillion of single family homes out there waiting for somebody to buy them. How long will that take to get absorbed? Each 1% change in the percentage of people who own homes represents about $1.2 million households, probably that number of renters. Personally, I think this number is going to keep going down. I think the younger generation is less inclined to want to own. They've seen the results of home ownership. The economy, at least here, isn't all that great. And I think it's going to take a while for people in general to have enough confidence to want to step up to the plate and buy homes um, at the pace they once did. One of the interesting things about Gen Y is, in large part, they want to live where they want to live. They, they chase geography, they chase lifestyle, they're not chasing jobs. For Portland, that's a good thing. You see on the left, Portland is tied, or Portland is in fourth place as one of the top places in the country that 18 to 34 year olds want to move to. We're a weird place, we've got a lot of bike paths. I mean, it's a great place to live. Now the bad news is we are not on the top 10 of the best economies. How does that play out? You know, you're gonna have a lot of people moving to Portland. I, you know, people say young people move to Portland to retire. Well, why? Because there aren't any jobs. Um, I'm not an economist, I'll tell you, I've never been busier in my law practice, but I'm not optimistic that what I have on my desk is indicative that Portland is generating jobs. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't really see us, you know, moving on that right side of the chart. But I do continue to see Portland being a place where people want to move. You know, big picture, where are we in, you know, 2011? Um, this is kind of the basis of the bet. The bet is, demographically, there are going to be more renters over the next few years. 
And in Portland, there are likely to be more renters even if our economy continues to suffer. Very little new stock is being built. I don't remember the number, but there are people who keep track of it. Every year, just because of deterioration, fire, earthquake, some portion of the housing stock just gets closed down, gets bulldozed. And we're going to wake up in a couple years in places like Portland and potentially have a housing shortage. And if you're an apartment owner in that housing shortage in 2013-14, um, that's a good thing. I was talking to Cody just before, and he and I were talking about, well, we each see about three years of acquisition activity. Then you could get to a point where a lot of people are going to say it's time to sell. And we were both kind of congratulating each other. Well, our business is good whether people want to buy or sell. They're, they're both transactions. And I would love for that to happen because five or six years of hard work, that's about what I'm looking you know, to head into retirement. <laughs> so again, if you want to make this bet, that bet would say this is the time to buy apartments, hold on, them if, hold on to them if you have them, build them if you can. Um, what I do for a living is help people and property and transactions put them together. Um, a sampling of what I do, and I'm going to talk about you know single family syndications all the way through real estate equity funds, uh, joint ventures, mezzanine loans, tenancies in common. I hope everybody can read this. Uh, if not, the caption. Will you children please learn to share your toys? There's a couple kids pulling apart a teddy bear. Or, or do I have to prepare a tenancy in common agreement for you? Uh, and this is a lot of what I do, helping people figure out how to divide the pie. There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, this one chart kind of describes a lot of structures. You could interchange some of the names here. I have investor in the upper right. That could be friends and family supplying some capital to a sponsor of an acquisition or a, a real estate development. It could be an institutional investor. It could be a REIT, a private equity fund, a pension plan. Uh, it could be a couple ticks. The picture would look a little bit different. Um, I put up here kind of a 90-10 relationship. I, mean, I can tell you today in the institutional investor market, it's not 90-10, it's 95-5. There is so much institutional money looking to get invested in quality assets. Uh, they don't want the sponsor to put 10% in. Now, I will say 90-10 is kind of where the institutional market is today for development projects. But for stabilized apartments, um, I'm seeing a lot of 95.5s. You've got to have the track record to do that. Um, I'd say in the early 2000s, I saw a lot of 90.10 deals. And then as we got into 2003 and 4, institutional investors, like everybody else, said, this is great. We're going up. It's going up forever. And 90-10 became 95-5. I've got a bunch of deals where the institution put in 97.5% of the equity. The sponsor often gets a 1% acquisition fee. By the time you're done, the sponsor can make money, end up with 25 or 5% of the deal for no carrying cost, have 5% of the equity, and then a carried interest. Again, you've got to have the track record to do that, but that's where the market is today among institutional investors. There's kind of a feeding frenzy among large institutions to try to get into quality assets. And they've all seen the same slides. They know, you know, Portland, Seattle, Washington, D.C. They know the same cities everybody else is looking at. Um, again, in this, yeah, go ahead. For what size um, Typically, those are going to be $20 million and up in order to attract an institutional investor, and sometimes bigger than that. Now, I represent a real estate equity fund uh, in town here, 
And I think of them as an institution with a small I, and they typically will participate in smaller deals that are 10, 15, 20 million dollar range. On behalf of some of my sponsor clients, they're often 40, 60, and 70 million dollar transactions. But this same structure applies to, you know, a fiveplex. Uh, how, you know, it's a pictorial representation of how the sponsor comes in with development services, construction management services, uh, property management, um, and an investor, anywhere from friends and family to institutions, provide capital with a loan in, in between. The other part of what I do is write all these agreements. This is kind of the holy grail of sponsors. It's where you get your promote. And you can see in this example, you start out getting 10% of the returns because you put in 10% of the capital. As the institutional investor makes a greater IRR, the sponsor incrementally makes a larger, larger share of the additional profits until with just very little down, an experienced sponsor can end up with 50% of the upside here in this example above an 18% IRR. Lots of issues when you are dealing with investor money, and again, this can be ranging from friends and family all the way up to uh, large institutions. Very carefully define what the returns are. IRR, I've seen probably 100 definitions of IRR in my life, and sometimes it makes a difference. How frequently are you compounding? Um, and so on, and, and what goes into it. Some definitions of IRR don't count cash flow from operations, only the cash flow from your capital proceeds transactions, sale and refinance, makes a huge difference. Clawbacks, you know, we can set these deals up so that the sponsor makes tremendous upside even though the investor may not have had an upside. Does some of that get clawed back? I mean, is there some limit to how much of a disparity? There's no right or wrong here. This is a matter of fairness. It's not a matter of law. It's, it's contract negotiation. But these are the issues that need to be addressed any time you're bringing in third-party money. One of the really interesting things I'm finding right now is in control issues. It Pre-meltdown, most of the institutions told the sponsor, you be the general partner, you be the manager, I just want veto rights on the really big major decisions. We're now finding, I think all the institutions got in a room and, and huddled and they all came out and said, we had too many uh, situations during the meltdown when we wished we could have run the thing and we probably could have, you know, saved some losses. So uh, now we're finding just all the institutions say, I'm the general partner, I'm the manager, same economic deal, but you're not in charge. You take orders from me. And they just want more and more control because they got burned a lot of times and now the asset managers within those institutions are calling the shots uh, as opposed to the deal guys. Um, for good borrowers, for good sponsors with great track records, um, Freddie Mac is very active today. Um, and I'm, I've seen just a huge volume of Freddie Mac multifamily loans. They suffered a lot in the meltdown too and they came back with what's called the CME program. It's called a commercial market execution. I don't know what that means or why they call it that. But what they're trying to do is standardize their multifamily loans so that they can syndicate them, get them off their books, put them out into Wall Street. And to do that, they're much less flexible on terms. They give you loan documents and you pretty much have to accept those loan documents. It's pretty tough to negotiate many changes. Um, they require a lot more legal due diligence than they used to, legal opinions, Non bankruptcy non-consolidation opinions. Uh, you know, used to be able to get 75% on forward-looking rents based on what I think I might 
you know, do to improve the apartment. Today it's, you know, 70%, 65, 70% max based on in-place rent. So they've gotten much more conservative, but they are still very active in the multifamily market. You know, second mortgages, you know, we're all familiar with that. That's going to be higher priced money. Your first mortgage holder often is not very excited about having a second mortgage on the property. It uh, interferes with their ability to uh, foreclose. And these are rates that are going to have tougher terms, higher interest rates. An alternative to a second mortgage is, is a mezzanine loan. Very similar in terms of the economics. It's going to be at a higher rate of interest. But you can often talk a first mortgage lender into allowing secondary financing through a mezzanine loan when they are not interested in a second mortgage, mainly because the second mortgage interferes with their remedies. With a mezzanine loan, you extend a loan not to the property owning entity, that's the property owner, SPE. You instead extend the loan to the owner or owners. They then pledge their ownership interest in the, the property owning entity. So the remedy for the mezzanine lender is to step in and effectively become the owner of the ownership entity subject to the first mortgage. And then kind of, kind of moving down or up the food chain, depending on how you want to think, you know, a hard money lender is typically a lender of last resort where somebody is going to go because they can't qualify for, you know, a better loan. Uh, these are going to be expensive. They require extraordinary collateral, usually collateral in addition to the property that's being financed. Um, sometimes when you're in a construction project, You've got construction guarantees out there. You're out of money. This is the place to kind of fill in the holes. Tenancy in common, uh, probably everybody's familiar with them. Another way to pull people with uh, capital together in order to finance a project. Uh, preserves the ability for people coming in to do a 1031, coming out. Uh, sometimes we do a drop and flop, you know, which uh, you operate as a partnership. You can't do a 1031 out of the partnership, but we drop out of the partnership, put it into a 1031 for a year, then each side can go their separate way. One partner wants to sell, cash out, great. One partner wants to roll into another property. They can do a 1031. You got to think of these advance in advance. You can't drop on Monday and flop on Tuesday. You you want to straddle tax years if you can, and the more advanced planning, uh, the better chances the IRS will recognize it. When we had our website developed, we were looking at various images. Our web developer came up with this one. I just loved it. I said, I don't, I don't care how we use it, but put it on the website. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. On to questions, I think. I'll just give a quick update on the uh, how we see the Portland apartment market from a broker standpoint, then we'll do a quick uh, question and answer. Uh, generally, with everything that everybody said, we're more stable than the Blazers front office from apartments. <laughs> um, according to the uh, Metro Multifamily Spring 2011 report that just came out, we have an overall vacancy of 3.8%. Uh, supply, we don't see catching up to demand anytime soon, though we are starting to see signs of new construction. We're still at some pretty historic lows for new uh, construction permits out there. Uh, Reese is forecasting 4.5% rental increases annually over the next five years for this market, and that would put us four, number four nationally, so all good signs. Uh, one negative that various people have touched on today is the continued increase in water and sewer bills, especially in the Portland market. Uh, they went up last year 9%, and we don't see that going away anytime soon. So that's one component that is continuing to increase. Uh, in sales, we've seen a dramatic sales uh, volume uh, increase, especially compared to 2009. We've had a large number of institutional deals uh, transactions, 
second half of 2010, and that's continued in 2011. And we've seen cap rate compression on the higher end institutional grade and well-located properties. We're starting to see more activity in kind of the B-grade properties, and the C quality is still not a lot of activity because um, this market is true, the capital is truly looking for quality as it's moving into multifamily. Uh, we think uh, 2011 will see this continued pace of increased um, transactions due to investors uh, repositioning to different assets. Some of the investors are just taking their chips off the table, and then you also have this capital that's been on the sideline for years trying to get into multifamily. Now, all, a lot of this is fueled by the historically low interest rates, um, and a lot of investors are trying to get things done before these interest rates change, and that's kind of the wild card out there. Once interest rates do go up, you know, what's that going to do to cap rates? So kind of to round it out, you know, the commercial real estate market's on the rebound, and apartments are definitely leading the way. So now we'll kind of start the Q&A. If anybody has any questions for any of the speakers, we can start. that out a little bit. When a first mortgage holder has to uh, foreclose, they've got to try to foreclose out all of the interest in the property, and that means they've got to add the second mortgage holder to their foreclosure. Um, they don't want to do that. They don't want to mess with that second lender. They also don't want a second party's deed of trust mucking up title and also imposing another set of uh, restrictions on um, you know, what kind of insurance, what kind of capital improvements and so on. I think the other issue is if there is a bankruptcy of the property, having that second mortgage on there, again, adds a lot of complexity and time um, and now a bankruptcy judge may look out for the interests of the holder of the second mortgage to determine if there's any equity as opposed to just allowing the holder of the first to take the property. Any other questions or? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, a lot of pit uh, property have uh, had some problems recently. What alternatives beside all, all the tick owners of that particular property uh, to get out of it, you know, like you mentioned the 1031. If not all agree about that, what other alternatives to, to get out of that? I mean, that's, that's a big problem. I don't know if I have any great solutions. And in order to have a effective tick, every single owner must effectively have veto rights over selling the property, financing it, major decisions like uh, who's the property manager. And Unless everybody agrees, in theory, there is no solution. You've got a stalemate with a tick. I've never been a, a huge fan, and I think, you know, syndicators made a lot of money selling ticks. I think a lot of people were willing to overpay for real estate in order to not pay taxes. And they, you know, in, in hindsight, hindsight's perfect. They should have just paid their taxes and reinvested. And, uh, but... I don't have any great solutions because of the uh, required structure of a tick. Any other questions? Thank you again for coming. Again, there's survey forms on the front, which is very helpful. You can fill them out. Thank you. Feel free to learn more about our firm by visiting our website or calling us directly. Thank you. Thank you.